Hi everybody, I hope you're all well. You can hear I've got a bit of a croak. I've got a cold typical on my week off. Um, so do bear with me if I need to blow my nose on during this session. Um, today's talk is quality improvement and service improvement projects for nurses. And it will be helpful for student nurses or trainee nursing associates looking at this topic as an assignment. There may be dissertation students out there thinking about doing a quality improvement or service improvement project. And also newly registered nurses or experienced nurses on leadership courses, having an overview, simple overview of quality improvement frameworks. So hopefully a good broad range of um, people that it may help. I hope you find it helpful. Do check out my other YouTube videos on my channel. It's free to subscribe on YouTube and lots of talks there with some practical, simple overviews to help nurses career development. So I hope you enjoyed this session. So today I'm going to go through some tips to identify an appropriate problem or issue to um, a, a, to find a solution to in your service improvement or quality improvement project. Models and frameworks, quality improvement um, frameworks to structure your project, some key stages prior to, during and after the project, some example projects and ideas, and then really importantly, how to disseminate and share results after, and some key references and resources as well to help students out there. Identifying an appropriate problem or issue to solve. So usually a quality improvement or service improvement project will link to improving the quality of patient care, care delivered or patient education or experiences or staff education or experiences in some form you should aim to make a difference by finding a solution to a problem an issue or a concern that needs to be improved so how can we do this differently how can we do it better what do you want to happen? So just having a think, reflect on your past experiences, what you're passionate about, and it needs to be measurable. So it needs to have a defined aim and objective and a measurable outcome and some robust data collection. And I'll talk about that link to some example projects later. And just remember that, that service improvement, quality improvement projects are not just for senior nurses or um, clinical governance teams. They're also for students, newly registered nurses. You've got a unique perspective, fresh ideas, and also clinical staff may have really practical, simple ideas. Choosing an area of interest, also with dissertation students, think about what you're interested in, what you're passionate about, what assignments and practice areas have you enjoyed as a student, what do you enjoy reading about and looking at current journals and topics to get some ideas. I've also got a YouTube video, how do I choose my nursing dissertation topic and some example research questions just to promote some ideas there. One thing to remember is that the smallest change may have the biggest impact. So you don't have to have a really complex idea. And the Hello My Name Is social media campaign is one example of that. It was initiated by Dr. Kate Granger and her husband, Chris Pointer, reminding healthcare staff about the importance of simple introductions. She had terminal cancer, she was on a hospital bed, and she observed that many staff that were delivering care wouldn't didn't introduce themselves before they delivered care and it now has billions of online engagements it's had a massive impact since this idea was conceived and an amazing um, change in healthcare another good example i think is from bradley and rees the reference is at the end of the slides and really just to show that you, it might be a small change that has a big impact however there will be um, time and commitment from people to embed that change in healthcare it doesn't just happen overnight and a systematic team approach must be used and um, 
So an example from Bradley and Reeves 2003, if you look at the article, it was triggered by a nurse who removed an untouched tray of food from a vulnerable patient. I think it was a trauma rehab ward and staff assumed that that patient didn't want it and it caused an incident report to be triggered. And so when they reflected on this and learnt from the incident, an idea was proposed by one of the authors in an MDT meeting to support at-risk patients and try and prevent this sort of thing happening. And they came up with the idea, a really simple idea, that the red tray would be used to highlight individuals who required nutritional assistance. Now, the key elements are, it was a simple idea, and it had impact on patient care and outcomes. It was systematic and a planned approach. You can see that in the paper. It was planned over a month. There was team collaboration. So it involved the multidisciplinary team, the trust, nutrition and dietetics department. It included teaching all the staff, healthcare assistants and domestic staff. And they used, as I mentioned earlier, you must have a measurement data collection, robust data collection. They used measuring tools for a baseline. So if you're looking at an improvement, you need to know what's happening currently. Why do I need that improvement? And to show data, to collect data and it to demonstrate improvement. And how uh, Bradley and Rees did that was an audit of 30 patients before and then one month after implementation. And there was a risk assessment tool that was used, I think, WASP, I think is the name of it. And um, the number of patients identified by the risk assessment tool rose from 0 to 11 over one third of patients because they were really trying to improve um, awareness and highlight patients that had these nutritional needs. So they increased awareness essentially. And they also used patient and relative feedback. So these are the sort of things, sort of things that you're going to have to think about when you do a service improvement project or QI project. What sort of, what am I going to measure? What are my data collection tools? So I think it's a really nice example. The overall outcome, there was successful in identifying and providing support for patients at nutritional risk. It refocused attention on patients' food consumption. It's not possible, they acknowledged, to quantify the extent to which the nutritional state of patients had improved as a result of this innovation, and it would need a randomised control trial. It's embedded in practice. The red tray scheme was successfully integrated with the routine of the ward to the benefit of patients. So you can see that with service improvement QI projects, quality improvement projects, there's the embedding. It doesn't just stop when you've done the um, project. You, you might have to repeat a project and I'll talk about a cyclical approach later. And or you may change. It may not have worked. It, it, you know, they could have had really um, not positive, no positive feedback from patients and it might not have worked and then you might have to rethink about um, that imp potential improvement but it did work it was successful and then what they did which many people don't do is publish and I will do a YouTube talk I think in the future on publishing and getting your work out there um, because there's so much good um, work going on and disseminating your results to support others. A publication is a fantastic way to get your work out nationally, or you could um, highlight it in blogs and there's various um, social media channels and forums, that national forums that you can disseminate your work. They did publish and it had an impact on another study that I'm going to talk about which is Hollis 2011. And this one, Nursing Times Award for Team of the Year. The HCA, because they'd heard about the Red Tray Project, which demonstrates the impact of Bradley and Rees publication, she's a health, healthcare assistant, so anybody can have that idea, suggested they use a model like the Red Tray model. And but they apply it to the jugs, the water jugs and the mugs for patients at risk of dehydration. And they assess that risk through must scores, water low, pressure, ulcer scores. And 
they did some baseline data. So before, 80% of patients had fluid balance charts documented and 66% had IV fluids. After the project, uh, and they'd implemented the red jugs and mugs, 100% of patients had fluid balance charts completed and the number of patients on IV fluids decreased from 66% to 25%. So that's the impact that that it's important to remember that a service improvement project, quality improvement project does not just be um, have to be focused on a patient outcome. It can be to link to your workforce, the environment. And I've got two examples linked to that I've been involved with linked to staff ed education and experiences, for example. So the first one, developing and evaluating a foundation preceptorship programme for newly qualified nurses. The references at the end and um, I was the project lead, but you never complete a project without massive collaboration, engagement, steering group. Um, and it, it's not achievable without that collaboration. And I'll talk a little bit about that on a slide later, how important that is. So essentially set up a mandatory three tiered programme for newly registered nurses. The group set that up and it was to inform future preceptorship. It was just for nurses at the time. It's moved on because when we do service improvement projects, the evaluation it informs future development and the data collection was questionnaires. There was a five point Likert and focus group to newly registered nurses and managers for the baseline and then after the project. And it was really well received. The key learning was that um, newly registered nurses wanted more preceptor or clinical super, um, professional supervision in their role when they're working clinically. And that's something that is, is coming out of a lot of research currently nationally. Second study um, project, service improvement project was reducing variations in clinical nurse educator roles, service improvement projects, standardizing roles and career pathways. And that was Ariel and Arda and I. And we aim to reduce variations in clinical nurse educator job roles, job descriptions and standardize care career progression pathways for clinical nurse educators. Again, it was the team, the divisional leads and um, the senior nurses were involved matrons. It was a team approach. It's never done in a silo. And we used data collection wise focus groups and um, interviews of clinical nurse educators and matrons to get that baseline and perceptions. This, um, the implementation was standardising roles, job titles, descriptions and plans, having career advice one to one for every clinical nurse educator and postgraduate certificate in education was offered. And the post feedback was 100 percent positive and there was some key areas to look at in the future as well. But just giving you some examples of education as well that can be looked at. Quality improvement is a systematic approach to improve the quality of healthcare services, patient outcomes. It includes continuous action, testing and measuring. And I hope that rather than giving some of these key terms at the beginning, I thought I'd talk through some of these service improvement projects and I've got a few more later to talk about. Um, but the term QI or service improvement, you'll see can be used interchangeably. When you have a service improvement project, um, or quality improvement project, it will have a defined start and finish. And there's some key stages to that project. But essentially, quality improvement is this approach to um, improving quality in healthcare. And quality links to being patient centred, timely, efficient and equitable. Team collaboration is essential and it may be co-designed with service users. Collaboration and dissemination I keep talking about. So you need to have for a successful project engagement with local and national teams early on. I know people that have started or gone in and tried to look at doing a project halfway down the line and they realise they actually can't do it unless they have authorisation. And it's much harder to get that later. And you can, you know, it can annoy people when you go back later as to why they weren't involved from the beginning. 
So a key tip for me is to find out all the key people that should be involved. You might take find inspiration and support and guidance from clinical governance leads, service managers, that should say medics, sorry, there's a spelling mistake there, AHPs or quality improvement hubs and leads. And quality improvement hubs um, enable and facilitate projects. They can provide coaching and mentoring. They can uh, provide quality improvement awareness and training. There may be a lead in your, in your um, hospital trust or community setting for priority projects. There may be funding available for you to develop a service improvement project right from newly registered nurse level. Um, there may be funding available for you to apply for and look on the quality improvement websites and these um, local hubs and national hubs on local trust internet sites. With collaboration, you need to find out who needs to authorise the project? You cannot just go into an area and start giving staff questionnaires without going through because you're taking staff potentially away from the care that they're giving to patients. So there has to be an element of authorisation. And similarly with patient, anything to do with patients, you'll need authorisation. Do you need a formal consent from a staff member or from the patient? And who is the project sponsor? So it might be the exec team. It could be research and development leads. And um, it's helpful to go through the National Institute for Health. I never get the title right. The National Institute for Health and Care Research, NIH. Oh, I think S. Um, but National Institute for um, Health and Care Research have got some brilliant resources and um, document stores there for you to have a look at. And they will have information on project sponsors, authorization and consent as well. And then the collaboration must link to dissemination. You can do a project, but what are you going to do with those results? You need to network and disseminate results. And it might be that the results show that this improvement doesn't work or this intervention or um, whatever it is you're measuring does not work. It might be that it needs to be tweaked and changed. It might be that it was fantastic and you want to disseminate it out. So linking to people in your institution to see if it needs to be rolled out or evaluated or tweaked. Um, publications are a fantastic way to, as I've shown with Bradley and Vic Rees' work and Hollis who, who also published, social media, national forums it can be shared with and, ch and charities as well. So some models and frameworks, if you're going to do a project, you need to use a systematic approach. And if you're going to write it up after as well, or if it's part of your dissertation, you need to look at some of these models and frameworks. Now, I haven't got them all by any means. I've just got a few. The other thing to say is there's an awful lot of um, different terms used with quality improvement. You've got quality improvement, clinical governance, risk management, change management, audit, leadership. Now, you can get really bogged down in a lot of those terms and um, there's a lot of buzzword words as well. Um, I have got a table in my book um, to help people with preparing for interviews, because if you're looking at developing into a senior nurse role, um, band six or seven role in any role, you may be asked about leadership or change or um, evaluative aspects of care. So it's helpful because I've got a table with some really simple overviews of key frameworks. I've got a lot more frameworks on there that you can um, have a look at. Um, so some of the key ones I've got Deming 1950 plan, do, check, act was a quality improvement model. And it's sometimes called the Deming wheel. And that later evolved into the plan, do, study, act wheel. And that's a simple four stage problem solving model, which I'll um, give you some practical application in a minute for quality improvement. It's reflected in many quality improvement pr approaches. There's also lean thinking, which is a change management approach that embraces five principles that essentially improve, aim to improve the flow of a patient's journey and reduce, eliminate waste duplication, for example. 
So with the Plan, Do, Study, Act, now I like this because it's I like simple, <laughs> um, which is the whole premise of my YouTube channel, trying to make practical application simple. So looking at a plan, what are you going to improve? And that plan must include a strategy or proposal for improvement. We talked about deciding your outcome measures, team collaboration, who do you need to talk to before you even start writing that plan, gaining uh, consent and authorization. There's the doing part. So there's the implementing of that plan, and that includes collecting baseline data. There's the so from start to finish, there's the doing. The studying is the data collections got to be analyzed. You've got to see what happened here. And when you're looking at data collection, it could be a self report, it could be observation, it could be listening to staff, it could be audits, it could be staff service user feedback, and or you could use established information systems. So I know people that have used um, instant reports and I actually wrote a paper. Um, it was a collaborative paper with some people from Oxford University on um, uh, it was introducing intentional rounding to look at the impact on falls. It wasn't embedded in practice in the end, actually, but um, there was a reduction shown with the research. And part of that data collection was looking at the incident reports prior to and post implementation, and there was a reduction in falls. So again, if you can use that data, something that's already there. Also, I suppose you could use friends and family um, surveys um, to look at patient feedback and relative carer feedback. So if there is a system there already, use it, makes it easier for you. So hopefully this will give you some ideas if you're doing dissertations as well to think about all these different types of data collection. Um, you know, and I talked about questionnaires and focus groups as well in the pa other papers that myself and Ariel, for example, had written. Act, act on the results. So are you going to adopt the result? Are you going to change or tweak it? Or are you going to discard it, it didn't work? still write it up because that's fantastic data for others to know about and then monitoring the change so you never finish a p plan do study act is cyclical so you go back again what we what are we planning to do with this data and you may begin again or you might look at plan for dissemination but there'll always be a cyclical aspect of continuous monitoring as well with lean thinking, five key pr principles, so specific value, so it's defined by the customer, should improve patient health outcomes or experiences, you identify the value stream or patient journey, the actions required, so it might be from admission to discharge, um, it could be from discharge to home, it could be, you know, whatever that patient's journey is. Make the process, so it could be in an outpatient as well, for example make the process and value flow. So aligning healthcare processes, you could be looking at documentation, filing systems, removing any waste, delay or duplication, letting the customer, they call it pull value towards them. So deliver care on demand, the customer care and product services need to meet their, pay, you know, the customer's needs. And finally, pursuing perfection. So continuously developing and amending those goals to reach that ideal where possible. With the project plan, with this, any quality improvement, service improvement project plan, key elements, which is summarising really that this talk, aims and objectives, the background to your study. So going and looking at what other people have done. So you could go and um, review some literature, for example, and see has anyone else looked at this topic area. So with the Hollis paper I talked about with the red jugs, they'd looked at Bradley and, and Rees um, paper and that actually initiated an idea. Looking at the scope of the project, how big do you want that project? Now, if you're a dissertation student and doing a research proposal, for example, so that links to a service improvement project. Um, sorry, if you're doing a proposal for a service improvement project or a QI project, you could think large scale um, because you might not have to implement it. Or you might think as a student, actually, I'm really passionate about this. This is something I do want to implement when I and registered so so you keep it really feasible and realistic 
But if, if it's an actual project that you're planning on doing, how feasible is it? So when I looked at my the three, I've been involved with a few projects now. Uh, when we looked at the Oxford University project, it was easier because I had the I wasn't the lead, for example, and um, they I was part of the project team. When I looked at evaluating the foundation preceptorship, I was project lead for that involving a massive team of people across the trust. I the scope was small because it was just the one cohort that we looked at. We did the intervention and then evaluated, but that then moved on to continuous evaluation and the project moved to um, the preceptorship for allied health professionals as well. And I came off as project lead. So that's where it had a defined end and start um, because the scope wasn't big enough. I didn't have the resources. It wasn't feasible to include AHPs as well. I would have had to have an AHP um, with me leading probably um, the project. So you have to think about the scope and what's achievable. Think about the method, the processes, and that include data collection and measures, which I've talked about. The timelines, when will it start? When will it finish? And the expected deliverables. So what are your measurable outcomes? And I hope that I've given you some practical examples. The resources, you know, there's going to be time. So if you're going to do it in your own time, because um, you're you know, that's not feasible if you're working full time. So trying to get um, you could get some scholarship money there. If you link with your quality improvement leads, you may be given allocated study time to actually deliver this project. And there's national and local potentially funding streams that you might be able to apply for. Um, so do look into those. Your manager might say this is absolutely fantastic. I'm going to give you time to do this. And that's where you have to have that collaboration at the beginning, because you might get some charitable funding if you can't get anything locally. And that all helps with delivering that project. Accountability. Who's going to be project lead? Project steering group. Who are going to be members of that group? The authorisation and consent and the identification of a project sponsor. And as I said, going on the um, National Institute for Healthcare um, Service Research, the national um, guidance will have a whole section on project sponsorship. And um, that might be somebody really um, senior in your trust. It might be linked to the research and development team, but you should have a project sponsor. How will you analyze data? I've talked a bit already about the different um, uh, methods, data collection. So your analysis will depend on how, we, how you're collecting data, presenting the results and disseminating those improvements. Why do projects fail? They haven't got an aim or objective. The plan isn't clear. There might be a lack of leadership or poor communication or team collaboration. So when you're starting a project, what was really helpful for the, all the projects I've been involved with is having the discussions at the beginning and saying, look, we're thinking about doing this. What do you think? And, and if you get people on board, you're, you might they might become members of your steering group, for example, um, and, and people may be passionate about that area. That all helps with that um, with that plan. Leadership. Lack, there may be a lack of leadership, poor communication, not supported by team or key players. So you have to have that engagement at the beginning and throughout as well, in case there's any hiccups. It might not adhere to local or national guidance. So if you're going to, um, especially with something to do with patient care, it must adhere to national standards and policies. So you can't think of um, looking at that improvement, that intervention, that change in practice without adhering to standards or policy. You might be unable to collect or analyse data. I know with doing my PhD project with the pandemic, it's caused a lot of delays. But an example might be a study that requires visitor feedback. So anybody doing a service improvement project when the pandemic hit and there was no visiting would have been delayed. Unmanageable workloads. As I said, it needs to be um, 
you, it needs to be you need to think about who the project lead is is it manageable with their workload and it has to be feasible and the timelines have, have to be feasible as well and having support and a team to help with inform those timelines if you've got a research development lead for example that you can talk to um, and go on the um, quality improvement local hubs you'll have people that might have done similar projects and people to advise about quality improvement projects just some um, example areas, as you can see really from some of the previous projects, improving patient or staffing experiences or communications, learning from mistakes. So Bradley and Ree's project was um, due to somebody taking that food tray away, for example, and they turned it around into this amazing project and um, improvement of in patient care. Improving patient pathways, as we talked about the patient pathways from admission to discharge, um, for example, um, looking at staff team building, improving patient staff education or support could be health promotion. Avoiding duplication waste, so reducing the time spent documenting, so looking at some of the documentation, you could look at the electronic patient record documentation. Um, does it meet the needs of nurses or um, midwives in your area? Increasing awareness, so about nutritional needs linked to Bradley and Rees, but health and safety, it could be linked to a specific patient's condition or needs or preferences. Um, it could link to your staff, um, your patient waiting room, for example, improving the environment in a, in a staff room, looking at um, I don't know, having water butts in an area for staff, um, staff professional development needs, improving communication. Um, it could be for patients in, in staff, patient waiting rooms that might be left for five hours, for example, and having a change in practice where you have um, somebody go and talk, to, go down every hour to say what's going on reduces frustration. I'm just trying to think of things out of out of the box at the moment looking at visiting times getting some feedback on on visiting times i mean that's something that i see so much especially on social media people really frustrated we could be doing some surveys with relatives on how it felt how it made them feel um staff induction packs as well could be improved so i hope that helps here are some of my references and um, resources there's some fantastic resources out there. I've just focused on two, but you could have there's a lot more out there. And um, I hope it helped. Do put some comments um, if you think it helped. Um, any uh, suggestions for future videos for you on my YouTube channel? Do subscribe. It's free. Or you can contact me on Twitter by DMing me or on my website or on Instagram. So I hope you found it helpful.